Good evening, my brother. Amen. Bless you. Thank you for joining. Hey, good evening, good evening, Cousin Robert. God bless you, sir. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to go ahead and um, get started. The Bible says where there's two or three gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. And you and I together make three people. So God's presence is here with us, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it's six of us on the line tonight. Praise the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. We're going to go ahead and, and um, go up in a word of prayer and go into our lesson tonight. Tonight I'm going to start a new book. I was uh, pondering this in my mind ever since last week. Um, what would be my next subject? And there's a book that I have been using on my morning devotion. It's called The Bait of Satan. The Bait of Satan. And that book is written by um, um, John, John Revere. John Revere. It's a very interesting book, and I encourage you to get this book if you don't have it, because it's, it's going to open your eyes up to teach you about dealing with offenses. The Bait of Satan, Living Free from Deadly Traps of Offense. That's the name of the book. The Bait of Satan, Living Free from Deadly Traps of Offense. And we're living in a time, God bless you, Cousin Joyce, we're living in a time where many people are becoming offended by different things that are happening into in the world today. We're offended about the war. We're offended why God is allowing things to happen in our cities and our communities. We're offended why God is allowing our children to be killed in the streets and people dying around us. There's so many different reasons to be offended, but yet God is in control of everything we encounter and go through in this life. But all we have to do is continue to trust in him. And the word offense, the word that means the violation, a violation or breaking of a social or moral rule, a transgression or a sin. And that's what we're seeing in today's time that many people are, law, are breaking the laws. There's so much going on around us that as a child of God, we have to stay connected to the Lord Jesus Christ and have our conviction, personal conviction, stirring in the faith where we not allow the enemy to sway us from our belief in God, our trust in God, our dependency on God, that we hold fast to the confession of our faith, standing on the word of truth with confidence and boldness, knowing that God is on our side. And sometimes we can cause other people to be offended by the way we speak, of how we uh, uh, mistreat them, or what, of what we do. It's, people get offended just for over little bitty things that's inadequate. It's just little minute things that could be happening in your life and someone can get offended just because you looked at them wrong. You know, so it's like whatever the enemy wants to put in people's mind to attack a child of God, even sometimes we attack other people unaware because of our, our faith in God and we come down on those who are sinners and we don't have no compassion. One thing about Jesus, before we go into word of prayer, I'm going to say this point that we're going to pray. Jesus had compassion on sinners. He never came down hard on a sinner who was ready to be convicted and change their lives to follow him. He was very loving and concerned about their well-being, about their life. Even when he fed the 5,000 on, on the mountain, he took two fish, five loaves of bread, and fed the multitude. Why? Because he was moved with compassion. And that's what we have to be as a child of God, moved with compassion every day of our lives that we not allow us to become offense to anybody else. One thing about people, people are going to get offended whether you do things or not. You do anything or not, they're going to be offended. Just because the way you are, people are going to be offended. I have folks offended of me 
just because the way I talk by the time about the Lord. But it's okay because I do not allow them to project their offense upon me to pull me out of my character or cause me to change my attitude and respond in a derogatory way the way they're coming at me. Amen. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for this lesson tonight, O oh God. We pray that you speak to our hearts by divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Father, give us revelation, knowledge, and understanding concerning the word of God, that we'll be aware of offense and even how we may offend somebody else, O oh God, by our actions or our behavior. We ask that you cleanse our minds, our hearts, O oh God, from sin and iniquity. Forgive us for our sins, knowingly, unknowingly. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb and come into our hearts, O oh God, and make us clean before your presence tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray pray. Amen. God bless you, Sister Linda. Bless you. God bless you. Good to have you on tonight. So, we're going to talk about offense. The bait of Satan, we're going to talk about offense because there's so many different ways to be offended. So, the prefix in the book is very interesting. It gives you a synopsis of what the book is all about. It says, the book you hold is quite possibly the most important confrontation with you you encounter in your lifetime. I say this with confidence, not because I've written it, but because of the subject matter, the issues of offense. The very core of the bait of Satan is often the most difficult obstacle in an, in, an individual must face and overcome. So you got to be able to face offense and overcome it by your submission to Jesus Christ. The disciples of Jesus witnessed Many great notable and notable miracles. They watched in amazement as the blind were opened, the dead were raised. They heard Jesus command a life-threatening storm to stillness. They saw thousands fed by the miracle of the multiplication of few fish, I mean few loaves and, and fishes. The list of miracles and wonders was so inexhaustible that according to the Bible, the world of books could not contain it all. So even all the miracles Jesus done, many of them are not even written in the book because he's done so many different things that were phenomenal and, and so interesting to where the Bible couldn't even record all the miracles Jesus done. Never before mankind witnessed the miracles, miraculous hand of God in such an overwhelming and tangible way. Amazed and all as disciples were, it was not these miracles that pushed them to the brink of doubt no, the challenge would come later towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. So even disciples towards the end of the ministry found reason to be offended. And Jesus told them, he said, because of me, many are going to be offended because of what I'm telling you I'm going to do with my life. When Jesus talked about going to the cross, dying on that cross to be rejected for mankind and, and, and save us our souls from hell, Many people were offended just from the conversation. So you can understand that today people are going to be offended by you because of your conviction of how God done miraculous things in your life, turned your life around, how he set you on straight street and empowered you by the Holy Spirit to live a free life in Christ Jesus. And because you always be full of joy, vitality, happy and excited, Folk around you who are miserable, they get offended. Folk around you who are in depression and darkness, they get offended because you always seem to have everything all together in your life. And you might be having the worst day of your life and nobody knows because you don't carry it on your shoulders. I had to learn that many years ago. No matter what I go through in this life, it doesn't predicate how my response is going to be to life. My response to life circumstances and situations is the Holy Spirit inside of me giving me the strength to push on through the trials and circumstances and know that in the end of my journey, there's a crown of life waiting for me in Christ Jesus. So that's good news. That's good news. So, it, so Jesus put it this way. Jesus had instructed his disciples, if your brother sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. My, my, my. 
that is the most challenging, even difficult for some believers. Because if you haven't grew to the level of maturity to overcome offenses when people mistreat you and do you harm, you carry on your shoulder the guilt and condemnation of unforgiveness. And that's one thing God wants us to know. That there's no limit to forgiveness. There's no limit to allowing your brother to be forgiven. So if someone offends you, we were offensive to God. When we didn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we were an offense to God. Because the Bible said the mind of the flesh was an enemy of God. <clears throat> so if your mind is an enemy, that means you are hostile, you are offensive. But because of the sacrifice Jesus Christ paid on that cross for your sins and my sins, he gave us the benefit of salvation. And one of the benefits in that package is learning how to receive as well as demonstrate and minister forgiveness to us other people. So he says the immediate response to him was increase our faith. Luke chapter 17 verse 3 through 5. Luke chapter 17, verse 3 through 5. And it reads like this. Then he said unto his disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. As a child of God, born again believer, saved, sanctified, filled the Holy Ghost, guess what? Offense is going to come. But woe unto him, <laughs> through whom they come. Jesus made it clear there will always be temptation to sin, but, the, but what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So in other words, a person can tempt you to react instead of being proactive. So when the enemy comes to attack you, through another individual, instead of recognizing that it's the enemy, the, the, borderline, the underlying issue is not the individual, it's the enemy using the individual to be offensive to you. <clears throat> so they will try to tempt you to pull you out of your character, to make you fall on your integrity, to make you sin against God because of the way they are, are responding to you. He says in the New Living Translation, it would be better to be thrown into the sea with a milestone or millstone hung around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. The King James says it like this. It would be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he would offend one of these little ones. We always identify the scripture that Jesus is talking about little bitty children. It's not about children. It's about believers, the child of God. And he said, it's better for you to throw yourself in the sea and drown <coughs> than cause a stumbling block to be in your brother's or sister's way. So you got to get in yourself and recognize the importance of repentance. Not only repentance, but forgiveness. Verse 3 says, take heed yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee. And we already talked about trespass in previous lessons. Trespass is to go against. Against you. Against the God in you. So if they trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. So it's very important to recognize that trespasses will keep you in a state of mind of unforgiveness. It will keep you locked in a spiritual prison in the mindset of unbelief, in the mindset of bitterness, and retaliation and hatred to where you want to respond to people the way they mistreat you. 
So Jesus says, if he repent, forgive him. But Mark 11th chapter, verse, 20, 20, uh, verse 20, 26 says, if you don't forgive your brother's trespasses, neither will your father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. So you got to get in yourself the attitude of Jesus Christ to where no matter how people mistreat you, I am not going to respond to them the way they're coming at me harshly. Folks are so mean. One thing I found out, church folk can be so mean. They don't care how they talk about you. They don't care what they say to you in church. And you have to have a heart of Christ to know how to deal with an individual when they come against you. He says right here, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. We've been taught rebuke means to slander them, to come down hard on them, to beat them to repentance, all of that. That's not what he's talking about. Rebuke is a word that means to correct, to chastise and love. So if you come to me harshly because of something you believe that I may have done or some rumor you have heard in the house of God that I suppose I have said, I have to respond to you as Proverbs 15, chapter verse 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words, harsh words, it stir up anger. So the more I respond the way they come at me, we're making the fire get even bigger instead of diffusing the fire. And so God says here through Jesus Christ, if your brother repent, forgive him. The miracles, let me go to the next verse before I go to the next, next statement. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, how many times can you handle somebody trespassing against you seven times a day? If someone came to you and they slandered you in your face, talking about you, backstabbing you, cursing you, saying you ain't no good, you a hypocrite, you a liar, you ain't gonna never act right, I don't never see, you always, you don't never carry no Bible, you always talk about being a minister of God, but you never carry a Bible, you, you all this, you all that, you think you're better than everybody else. If they keep on doing it throughout the day, it's gonna vex your spirit. However, the response Jesus says, he says, if he trespass against the seven times, Seven is the number of completion, right? The biblical number for seven means complete. The eighth number is a new beginning. So it says, and seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent. He said, thou shalt forgive him. Woo-wee! That's tough. But it's the righteous thing to do in the presence of God. Because one thing about God, we talked about last week, God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. So if they keep on doing things to you that's trespassing and you're dis displeasing you and against your approval to mistreat you, he says, I take care of them. You just do what I told you to do. Forgive them. And one thing I found out, when Jesus told the disciples one occasion, he said, he said that brother sinned against you, forgive him. He didn't know anything. He says, another scripture he talks about, bless them that curse you and say all men are evil against you falsely for my name's sake. For so persecuted the prophets who went before thee. So in other words, I bless my adversary I turn them over to the hands of God and I allow God to take the vengeance and the reciprocation into his hands to deal with my enemy. So some battles, we don't need to fight. We try to fight flesh and blood the way they come at us. But God says your greatest fight is in the spirit realm for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rules of darkness of the age and spiritual weakness in high places. That's heavenly realm. So as a child of God, 
I'm seated in the heavenly realm. So my battle is in the heavenly realm. So all I'm doing is sitting down in Christ Jesus' victory. So he promised me that I don't need to fight, that God himself will fight for me, then all I'm doing is resting. I'm resting in the finished work of the cross. God bless you, Pastor Denise. I'm resting in the finished work of the cross, trusting in God's victory that already been supplied through the sacrifice on the cross. So when Christ rose from the dead, guess what he did? He took the sting of death. He, he robbed the grave. He defeated the grave. He rose victoriously. And he said, you know what? The keys of heaven and hell is in my hand. Therefore, I give you the keys to the kingdom. Not only give you the keys to the kingdom, but now you have the same victory to overcome your adversary. So if we have the victory, then why are we so easily offended? Paul spoke to the church of Colossae. He said, people get offended at this, they get offended at that. He said, people get offended because of something they don't understand. And we have to recognize that offense is going to come, but where is your heart when offense comes? So in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17, it says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Don't go tell everybody their problem that you have with this individual, they have with you. Don't go talking about the dispute or the fallout you have between your brother and sister. He says, go and tell him his faults that's between you and him alone. Not only that, if he hears thee, then thou shalt gain thy brother. In other words, you win him over to repentance. You win him over to forgiveness. Because it's about you and God having the slate clean between you and your brother. It's not about everybody else knowing your business, everybody else gossiping in the church about your business because you done told the wrong person. Leaky, what did I say? Leaky lips sink ships. So if I got a leaky lip and I'm telling everybody a situation I had with a certain individual, guess what happens? That individual tells somebody else, and it tells somebody else, and it tells somebody else, and it tells somebody else, for you know everybody knows your problem. And they look into your face, smiling at you, and backstabbing you because they heard about what went on. I remember a little game that they did when it was in elementary school. And the teacher said, a mother sent her child to the store. And she told her to go to the store, get, get some milk, a loaf of bread, and some cheese. So on her way to the store, she runs into a friend. The friend says, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to the store. What are you going for? My mother told me to get some milk, uh, some bread, and some chips. Then that person tells somebody else, before you know it, the whole message got misconstrued from what the initial message was from the mother. So when she comes home, the mother says, you get everything I told you to get? Oh, I uh, got some milk, but then I bought some candy, and I bought some chips. She said, I didn't tell you to go still for that. She said, I told you to go get some milk, some bread, and some cheese. Why? Because we don't pay attention to the final details. So when God gives us a message and conveys us what we are to do in divine order, he's looking for you to listen. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. So if I got an offense against an individual, I have to be quick to hear. Hear the conversation. If someone come to you harshly and angry and upset, listen. Don't say a word. I found this out in security. It's very effective. I worked in security for over 20 years. And in security, I found out that when people will come to me harshly and upset about something, the way the staff treated them in the hospital, I listened. And after I listened, I'm writing down details, and I'm writing down what they're saying in a nutshell. And then when they finished, and I responded to them, oh, so you said this, 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 and this person did this. And they said, yes. I said, okay, well, I will investigate the situation. 
or if they had an item stolen in the hospital. They say I was in the ER initially, went, was, was admitted in the hospital, went to a room, and they supposed to brought my possession to the room, but I'm missing my wallet. So I have to go to an investigation to find out where did they come from? How did they get to the hospital? So it's like going from A to Z to find out where's the missing wallet. We have to do that with God's word. We need to investigate God's word. We need to examine God's word. We got to apply God's word to the attitude of our mindset. So when the enemy comes and try to trap you and bait you, you are paid attention to details. So now you know, oh, this is not God. This is the enemy trying to lure me into a bait to cause me to fall and stumble in darkness. And God warns us before destruction. So back to our book. It says, the miracles had not inspired a cry for greater faith or for raising of the dead or for a calm, for a calm seat, but the simple command to forgive those who have wronged you. That is so powerful. That is a powerful statement by itself. Learning how to forgive those who wronged you. Jesus said, it is impossible that offenses, he said it's impossible no offenses should come. Luke chapter 17, verse 1, we just read that. It is not a question of, of opportunity to be offended, but what your response will be. When offense comes, what will your responsibility be? If someone comes to you and they have a problem with you or you have a problem with them, what will your response be? That's what God is looking for. Where's your attitude? Do I have the attitude of Christ when someone comes to me with an offense? Or do I have the attitude of the carnality nature? Of the carnal nature? The carnal nature always is in defensive mode. I have to defend myself before I get hurt. And one thing I found out, I heard someone in a conversation recently. They said, I've been hurt so much. And this is a young lady said this to me. I've been hurt so much to where I got my guard up all the time. So if hurt does come, it won't affect me. That's a sad state of mind because now you set yourself up to be in a place to receive offenses. God says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So the attitude, which is the mind of Christ, it says, the more I keep the word in me, the more the word gives me what to say through the power of the Holy Spirit when offenses come. So my reaction will be proactive according to the word of God and not according to the carnal nature. The carnal nature says if you be offended, get an attitude. You get offended, get, get fouled and upset and uptight and start cussing them out and give them a the piece of your mind. I heard so many times growing up, people in the body of Christ say, if you're going to make me lose my religion, you keep talking to me that way. I'm going to lose my religion, and you're going to find out who I really am. That's because Paul puts it this way. You are still a babe in Christ, desiring the sincere milk of the word. A baby gets an attitude quickly. A baby start crying quickly. A baby get hurt quickly. Because they get offended. And one thing about a baby, a baby can't defend themselves. So all they know what to do is cry. Who are you crying to? Think about this. Who are you giving your heart hurt and pain to? Is it to the Lord or to another individual who can sympathize with you and have compassion? Or are you going to the Lord and seeking counsel from someone who is full of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, who walked with God for a very long time and knows how to comfort your heart with the word of God and pray for you? That is very important to have somebody in your life who don't mind praying for you when you're hurt. It's very important to let your guard down and let God come in. Unfortunately, the, the fact that not some, but many are offended and are held captive. Because of offense, 
it is an unfortunate fact that some will be offended and held in prison. You'll be held in a spiritual prison in your mindset. It has been 10 years since this book was launched. It's been over 10 years since I got this book. In the time period, we received the countless letters, numerous testimonies of individual lives, families, and ministries that have been healed and transformed by the truth from the words of God contained in this book. We have included a sampling for your encouragement. <clears throat> for all of them, we rejoice and give God all the glory. So we got to give God the glory. Then he goes on and says, our leaders shared our church was in the middle of a huge split. It looked hopeless. And I gave a copy of the beta Satan to, the, to every elder. The split was diverted. And we were one, we said, and we were one today. And we are one today. So the split was diverted. So what the enemy is trying to do to divert, to split the church, this book was the tool they needed to divert the plan of the enemy and cause them to come back together in one accord. Many marriages have been saved. Recently, recently speaking, in Nebraska, a couple approached me. The wife confessed, I was offended 10 years ago by the leaders in this church. I became bitter and suspicious, constantly defending myself and my position. My marriage suffered from my anguish, and my husband was in the process of divorcing me. He was unsaved and wanted nothing to do with the church. Someone put a copy of the bait of Satan in my hands. I read it, and within a short time, I was completely set free from offense and bitterness. This book is liberating. This book is an eye-opening tool that God had this man of God write for the body of Christ today to open your eyes to begin to see with the spiritual eyes and not the fleshly eyes. This lady testified how this book saved her marriage. There are many people who have read this book and got many different stories that they can relate to how God used this book as a tool to save their lives, save their businesses, save their churches, save their children. And I tell you, the more we seek God, the more we put God first, God will always find a remedy for every attack the enemy brings against you for your demise. So then he goes on and says, when my husband saw the changes in my life, he surrendered his life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and stopped the divorce proceedings. That is so awesome. And you know what? God can do that. If your heart is in right position with God and right standing with God, God can save your marriages. He can save your business. He can save your life. He can save your children. He can save your home from being repossessed. I mean, all this stuff, all the foreclosures, car being repossessed. God can stop all this stuff when your heart is right with him. Because you're not allowing the things the enemy do to you to offend you. The greatest attack the enemy uses against a child of God is in your mind. If I can change your thought life to become offensive, to the word of God, I can turn your faith from trusting God and walking in truth and righteousness. The husband stood by his wife, smiling. When, he, when she had finished sharing, he affirmed the wonderful changes in his life and their home. The testimony that touched my heart the most occurred when I ministered in Naples, Florida. I just spoke in a, a, a burly, he said, a burly middle-aged man stood up before the congregation and wept, and he relayed his tragic story. All my life, I have felt like there was a wall between me and God. How many times you felt like that? How many times you felt like there was a separation between you and God? Every time you prayed like God didn't answer your prayers. How many times? You can even put a response on here. Put, you can put a response. I'd love, love to see your response tonight. How many times have you been in a place where you, you was in a dark place in your life, and you cried out to God, and it's like everything kept getting worse, like your prayers not being answered. You went through the divorce. Your children split up, left the house. Matter of fact, some went into prison, some on drugs, some prostituting. All these different things begin to happen the moment you start praying. That's the enemy. The enemy knows how to bring discouragement in your heart to try to get you 
to stop trusting and believing in God. So this man says, all my life, he felt like there was a wall between him and God. He says, I would attend meetings where others sense God's presence, while I watch, detach, and numb. So he was sitting in church meetings where God's presence was there, but yet he was separated from God. He felt himself like God didn't care about him. Felt like God wasn't hearing him. Even when I prayed, there was no release or presence. Several weeks ago, I was hand, handed the book, The Bait of Satan. I read it in its entirety. I realized I had taken Satan's bait years ago. Check this out. This is going to blow your mind. I realized I had taken Satan's bait years ago. And because of that, I hated my mother for abandoning me when I was six months old. I realized I had to go to her and forgive. I called and spoke with her for only a, a, the second time in 30 years. I cried, Mom, I held unforgiveness towards you all of my life for forgive for for, for uh, he said all my life for giving me away. She began to weep and said, Son, I have hated myself for the last 36 years for leaving you. That is a very powerful testimony. How many of you tonight? are holding on to something that happened to you years ago and haven't let go of it. It might have been a husband mistreated you. It might have been a wife mistreated you. It might have been things, an event that took place in your life that you felt God was to blame. How many times have you allowed yourself to get into that place of discontentment where you felt like God didn't care anything about you anymore? This man was in the same type of place, in a dark place, and he felt like it was that God didn't care about him, and he was holding on to unforgiveness towards his mother for 36 years for abandoning him. It's amazing how people even today in the body of Christ are still stuck in the prison of their minds in unforgiveness and still holding on to an event or circumstance that happened in their life 20 years or 30 years ago and haven't let go of it. And God is saying tonight, it doesn't matter what you've been through. You got to get to the place where you say, God, I can't handle it no more. Help me to forgive the individual, even forgive yourself for holding on to unforgiveness and allow the spirit of living God to cleanse your mind and your heart and restore you back into right standing, right relationship with himself. Guess what? God does it. He does it in an instant. The moment you have the willingness, the key is the willingness. Are you willing to go to somebody who wronged you and said, you know what? The Lord been pressing my heart to contact you and ask you to forgive me for holding to unforgiveness towards you for what you did to me 20, 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And allow God to restore that relationship. He continued, I forgave her, and she forgave herself, and now we are reconciled. That is so awesome. That is a love story right there. Then he came, then, he said, then came the exciting part. Now the wall that separated me from God's presence is gone. The moment he acknowledged what was the deep-rooted cause of the separation between him and God? God, in an instant, allowed his eyes to come open to see he was there all along. He was blinded by unforgiveness. So he couldn't see God's presence, couldn't feel God's presence, didn't know God was there because he held on for so long for unforgiveness. But I thank God for grace. Because even in that moment, what I feel like is a hard thing to do. God says when your strength is weak, his strength becomes perfect in your weaknesses. And all you got to do is acknowledge that I need your presence, God, in my midst to help me to overcome the offense of unforgiveness. And when I allow God to come into my heart, the moment I give it up, let God come in, it's the moment he comes to my life, he cleansed my mind, he changed my heart, he purified my thoughts, 
He, he put me right back in the place where I need to be in him from the beginning where nothing else is able to offend me because of the grace of God has covered me. If I'm covered in the grace of God, then the offenses shouldn't affect me. I've been offended many times. And I thank God for the spirit of maturity. Because the spirit of maturity, when people offend you, the Lord says, don't, don't say nothing. Just be quiet and just start praying inwardly. Rebuke that spirit inwardly. And sometimes you have to verbally re rebuke that spirit. Excuse me, uh, brother or sister. I rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus. That's not of God. Because it's the attitude that God is looking for. It's not the words you're saying. It's the attitude of how the word is projected. I could come to you knowing you out of order with God and come to you harshly trying to tell you to change your life. I'm doing what you're doing. You're going to die. I heard a preacher years ago from, uh, from Florida. He was, he was a gloom and doom preacher. Every message was gloom and doom. Every message was you're going to hell. Every message was you got to repent. And it was so stern and so harsh to where people started leaving the ministry. But that yet there were those who stayed connected to the ministry and repented. Some people can take a harsh message of repentance. And some can't. Some people's hearts are, are mushy and hurting and broken and bru bruised and wounded to where I have to come and meet people right where they are. Everybody can receive the same message in the same tone of voice. My mother said to me all the time growing up. She says, it's not about what you say to people. It's how you bring the message to them. If I come to you in love and I tell you, brother, sister, God loves you. But God is not pleased with the life you're living right now. And I got something to share with you that God put in my heart to share with you. The person going to like, oh, they let down their guard. The intenders come open to hear what you have to say. Why? Because I broke through the barrier. We have to learn how to strategically break through Satan's baits and his barriers in the lives of God's people to where we can speak a word that will set them free from the inside out. We want to try to convert them from the outside in. It doesn't work like that. Because we want to dress them up and clean them on the outside. When God says, no, I'm not looking at that. God says, I'm looking at the heart. I want to change the heart, then the outside going to change. And that's the power of the grace of God. The love of God, the mercy of God, the compassion of God. It begins to soften our hearts to receive his grace and mercy. When I deserve the judgment of God, and I deserve the punishment from God, <coughs> God says, guess what? I don't see you. I see the blood of Jesus that was poured on that cross for your sins and iniquities, your law breaking and trespasses. I see the blood of Jesus that washed away all your sins and, and set you free. And I looked at, took that sin and I and he taken it as far as the east to the west to remember no more. So I'm not looking at that no more. I see Jesus. So when God looks at you, he's looking at the Jesus in you. Even a sinner man, God sees the Jesus in them to be revealed through them when they come to the place of repentance. It's just like this man held on to unforgiveness for 36 years. And that unforgiveness kept him in a dark place where he was separate from God's voice. Couldn't even see God, hear God. Prayers felt like they weren't being answered. And I thank God for this story because it lets us know that when we come to the place we recognize the fault in our own self. Matthew, Matthew says it like this, chapter 7. Why are you going to try to take the beam out of your brother's eye when there's a mote in your own eye? You got to get the thing out of your own your self. Because we have a fault in ourselves, but I don't want to deal with the fault in me. I got to deal with your fault than my fault. But God says, nope, I got to deal with the, the mess in my life, but I can deal with the mess in somebody else's life. So when God cleaned me up, I can come to my brother and my sister, give them an encouraging word to help change their life and clean them up and set them on the right track with God. At this point, he just completely lost it and wept. He struggled to get the, these last words out. Now I cry in the presence of God like a baby. 
That is so awesome. That's amazing. When forgiveness, forgiveness is administered in our hearts and we pour it out in somebody else's life and we get to cry out to God in his presence, he said, like a baby, he cried. Because that's what God's looking for, a heart that's humble, a heart that's yielded, a heart that's surrendered, a heart that's saying, God, I tried it my way, I can't do it no more. And then God comes in, he takes over. Now, he says, I know the strength and the reality of that captivity. I have been held hostage to its numb torment for years. This book is not a theory. It's, it is God's word made flesh. It brims with truth I have personally walked through. I believe it will strengthen you as you read, as you ask the master to increase your faith. As you grow in faith, he will receive you, he will receive glory, and you shall be filled with joy. May God richly bless you. So this is just a prefix in the book, The Bait of Satan, Living Free from the Deadly Traps of Offense. So we're going to stop right here. We'll pick it up next week, going to the introduction. And I guarantee this book is going to be liberating to you. It's going to set you free as it does with me. The more I read this book, I read it before. The more I keep going through this book, the more my eyes is coming open, my ears are being attentive to God's voice to hear his voice speaking, to even receive conviction of heart, to want to change and live right for God, and trust him in his word to keep me secure in his presence. And guess what? God does it every day of your life as you walk by faith and not by sight into the promises of his word through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's liberating. It's, it's mind-blowing. It's life-changing. And it's enriching to your soul. From the word of God. Amen. I thank everyone again for coming on tonight. And I pray this word tonight even give you a glimpse to begin to examine your heart. To see where you are in your heart. Are you holding to unforgiveness? Are you stuck in a dark place? Are you blinded from the truth of God's word because of some sin or iniquity in your life? Let the spirit of God bring conviction to change your life from this day forward. It's a guarantee your life will never be the same again after hearing this word, and the word will transform your life. It's a guarantee from the spirit of the living God. If you desire it and you want it, God will come through with his bulldozer. He will shatter the stronghold. He'll break down the walls, the barriers, the barricades that you built around yourself to protect yourself from offense. God will come in and set you free from the inside out. He who the Son has set free is free indeed. Glory to God in the highest. What a mighty God we serve. God, we worship you. We praise you. You're awesome. You're sovereign. You're holy, God. We bless your name, God. We praise you for your word, God. We exalt you, O Lamb of God. Mighty is our God, strong in battle, mighty warrior, sovereign and holy. God, we praise you. Lord God, I thank you for this word tonight. I pray this word, Father God, will make an impact in all of our life to make us want to change our hearts, desires, our attitudes, our lives, to live for you, God, from this day forward. If there's any error in our lives that we know, Father God, we haven't been living right, Father, we're lacking from, from living, Father, or we even giving to you, God, the air in our lives, we're holding back on, Father, it's a stronghold. I ask tonight, God, that you help us get to the place of conviction, true conviction, for it's godly sin that draws men to repentance. Give us that godly sorrow for the sin in our lives, oh God, till we want to change our lives. And we allow you to do that change, to operate in our hearts, to take out that stoning heart, the heart of the world, and give us a heart of flesh after your spirit, that we walk, Father God, in the promises of your word as free moral agents in Christ Jesus. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise. And I thank you, O oh God, for the work you're doing in our lives as we engage in this new book, The Bait of Satan, that you, God, will help our lives begin to grow in grace and in the knowledge of who you are. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Give God some praise. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You might be on tonight and you don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior. <clears throat> I want to introduce you to our friend, to our brother, our elder brother, our Savior, our Lord. His name is Jesus. So if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just give your sins and clean from all the righteousness. All you got to do is repent and God will come into your life and cleanse you and save you and change you by praying this simple prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and that I need you to come into my heart and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, I thank you for the blood of Jesus. Cleanse me from all sin and iniquity, God. In the areas of my life where I failed to let go of the things, oh God, that held me in captivity and bondage, I ask God right now that you begin to operate in my heart. Give me your heart tonight, oh God, that I have nothing to hinder me from living my life for you, God, that I will begin to sense your presence and the fullness of your glory manifesting in my life from this day forward. And I thank you, Lord God, for saving us, restoring us, reviving us, bringing us to a place of repentance. Father God, we can have a clean slate from this day forward to live our lives for you. In Christ Jesus, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Again, I thank you for tuning in tonight. I pray you go back and listen to this lesson again. And allow it to even share it with somebody. Whoever God put in your heart to share this lesson with tonight, encourage somebody with this word. Because there are people we all know who have an attitude of offense. Every time you talk to them, they're always offended about something or they project offense towards you. We know individuals right there. And God says, we have to be reconciled. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So I charge you tonight, go and reconcile. Might be with the mother, might be with the father, might be with your sister, might be with your brother, might be with your children. Go and be reconciled tonight by the spirit of the living God and allow God to restore that relationship that you can live in the love and abide in the truth of God's word from the day forward. And God continue to bless and enrich your lives and relationship that you have with other people. So, Father, tonight, I thank you, God, for your presence. As we, Father, God, end this lesson tonight, give us a hunger and thirst for righteousness that only you can feel. Help us, Father, God, to want to desire to grow in grace and the knowledge of who you are, that you will be glorified. And I thank you, Lord God. For every person heard this word tonight, oh God, that you bless them, that you rain upon their lives, showers of blessing, God. They don't have enough room to receive. And I thank you, oh God, that you open up the doors in their lives, closed doors need to be closed. Father God, cause their barns to be filled with plenty, that vats overflow with the new wine of your spirit, God, that every need be met by Christ Jesus. And we give you glory, we will forever give you the praise and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you. Thank you. Pastor Cornell for coming on. I saw you on here tonight too as well. Uh, Prophet April, God bless you. Amen, amen. Cousin Jacqueline, God bless you. Amen. Good to see you on my sister on tonight. Praise the Lord. Amen. You all continue, my friend. Melissa, God bless you. Y'all stay encouraged. Stay encouraged. Encourage somebody this week. Speak a kind word to somebody who needs to hear a word from the Lord. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Speak that word with boldness. Just like on the day of Pentecost, when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they were endowed with power from on high, and they spoke with boldness about the Lord Jesus Christ. Go and share the good news with somebody, and may God's blessing and grace be upon you, his face shine upon you, turn his face towards you, give you peace, and cover you from this day forward until we meet again. Shalom. In Jesus' name, good night.